This is a story of risky behavior. Fear. We could see the train wreck coming. If you have only one or two or three buyers for your product, then you're very likely to face a situation where these buyers are able to exercise market power over you and your price is gonna be bid down relative to what it's worth. So that was the panic. When, it, when push came to shove and we got pushed to lower and lower prices, everyone was worse off. The whole industry went down. Well, I never thought about myself as an, e as an evil genius, but yeah. maybe I am. I don't know. This is the story of a negotiation, a bargaining association, and how it died. Terry Barton was the manager of the California Pear Growers Association when what's about to happen in this documentary actually happened. Terry was the first to realize that the story of what happened to the pear growers would be valuable to growers in any commodity who are trying to make up their minds. We were so impressed with the presentation that he's been giving to grower groups that we decided to make it into a movie. But I haven't mentioned the worst part of the offer yet. They gave us an ultimatum. If we didn't like their offer, they'd send a letter to all the non-members saying they would accept contracts on a first-come, first-served basis until their needs were met. Well, what'll help you understand this a little better is the CEO of Signature Fruit was actually my predecessor at the pear grower, so he knew all the weak spots in, uh, in our rules. Our bylaws allow growers to resign by the end of December, so Signature's offer was made in early December. And they wanted to send out this letter to the non-members in January. This meant that if someone wanted a home and signature fruit, he had to resign from the association. Growers were afraid. They were afraid to stick together. They were afraid to anger the processor. And as I said, they were afraid they would ultimately lose the home for their fruit. So during December, a number of the frightened growers resigned from the association. So this now meant there were enough non-members to supply most of Signature's needs. This seriously weakened our bargaining power and Signature was able to take advantage of it. Well, just after that, without notice, Signature reneged on their process. They sent out the ultimatum, ultimatum letter anyway to non-members and uh, <clears throat> we were in for it. They quickly called the non-members and told them, well, you have to sign now or the tonnage will go to somebody else. In addition, there might be more volume available to you because some other people, particularly the association, may not sign up. This meant uh, <clears throat> that the association, if we didn't sign, well, the contract was up to five years So at the, by this time, so there would be no contracts for the association member for five years. Well, the non-members panicked and they took this five-year price for roughly $198 a ton. That's $20 a ton or about 10% less than what Del Monte had already accepted. And $37 a ton or about 16% less than the previous year. Uh, this was a loss of about $7 million. And it would last for five years. So you're looking at somewhere around $35 million in our industry. Well, naturally, the board and the grower members panicked. They feared doing anything would jeopardize their ability to get a home. And so basically the board capitulated, Signature won, and in addition to that, we had to drop Del Monte's price to the same as Signature, so we lost another several million dollars. Well, they made the offer to all of the large growers, especially those that weren't involved in the association. And then they turned to the association and said, and we'll sign up association members as well if you agree to these terms. So. We were basically over a barrel. And one day, uh, Signature Fruit went into uh, some of the grower, the major growers that had packing sheds and offered them a price, take it or leave it, and if they turned it down, they'd go to the next guy down the road. And it broke the price that year. And it broke the back of the bargaining association. You could take this deal either at 
two years or at five years. So since the, we were collapsing here, I said, well, let's do the two-year deal, re-solidify ourselves, get together, get everybody together when they realize what a bad deal it is, and then negotiate from strength. And everyone said, that's a great idea. Mom. Let's do that. You know, I think you're right. You know. So then when it came time to sign the contracts, I found out I was the only one that signed for the two years. Really? Wow. <laughs> Everybody else had signed for five years. I was the single grower who had signed for two years. And it, it isn't so much that I get, that, I, that that really bothers me is, why didn't they call me up and say, hey, you know, we're all gonna go for five years, you should go for five years too, because you know, otherwise you're gonna be out in the market. Um, but nobody did. You know, it, 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 it's just, uh, you know, and these were friends. We're telling the story of a group that really didn't exercise those rights. Does it strike an economist as something of an anomaly to be granted this opportunity and not really use it to the, to the fullest? Well, probably it does. Uh, and, uh, and I've talked to people outside of uh, agriculture who don't understand that uh, those types of protections are in place. And, and, they, and they do think, well, wow, there's, there's, there's a great opportunity. And certainly it's probably true over the history of the act that... Uh, Farmers have not taken advantage of it the way that they uh, could have and should have. When push came to shove and we got pushed to lower and lower prices in, the, in our bargaining unit, as the bargaining unit broke down and people were able to make side deals, and the, the net effect of that was that um, Everyone was worse off. The whole industry went down. My goal was to develop a long-term strategy that would be beneficial for both the processor and the grower. How well did the negotiation move along? It moved, uh, it moved well. I don't remember it being uh, a problem. I don't, see, I, I really don't remember anything being that negative about the whole process. There was a letter to growers that has been described as the ultimatum letter. Do you remember what the ultimatum letter said? No, I don't. Okay. I mean, it's been a lot of years, and I don't remember it being an ultimatum or, you know, we always sent, would send a letter out spelling out the terms and conditions of what we thought the deal was going to be. Uh, was that an ultimatum? Uh, you know, maybe in retrospect they felt like it was. It certainly wasn't in our mind. If 100% um, of non-members had become members and stood their ground and said, no, we don't like your five years, we don't like your pricing arrangement, that sort of thing, how do you think it would have played out at that point? We'd have gone to a one-year deal. Every time they, the people that have leased our pairs come out to talk about the pairs or whatever else they say, you are so lucky you got out of this business when you did because it's gotten, only gotten worse. Another result of this and sad result is that many growers had gone bankrupt and they had either removed or abandoned their orchards. And in retrospect, a lot of this was unnecessary. I guess the major weakness we had in these negotiations, weaknesses, I guess, would be that not everybody was a member of the association. and even those that were members didn't always stick together on this because they, they put their own interests a little bit ahead. Would you have, with all your experience on both sides, would you have a message to non-members about the impact it has of them being outside on, on negotiations? Well, sure. They're, they're what we call free riders, and they think it's smart. And for a short-term basis, it is, but ultimately for the industry, it's not. You know, it's, they, if they want a stronger industry, if they want a stronger... Uh, you know, come out of the program with a better long-term venue for their, for their future production, for their next generation of kids who are going to become farmers, then being a free rider is putting it all more at risk. Whatever you end up doing, you have to compromise in order to stay together. Because if you only put your interests first, then you can't have a unified face. And believe me, it's very obvious when you don't to your opponents. If you're in a negotiation and you are weak because 
people are not willing to stay together, it becomes, uh, it becomes obvious to the people you're negotiating with. And hopefully the people rem will remember the history of what happened and get more people involved uh, and be more cohesive. A couple of years into the five-year deal, most growers had figured out that it wasn't going their way, and efforts were begun to reconstitute the group. They reworked the bylaws, assembled a new board, and reduced the fees. Now, 85% of acres are ascribed to the group, and an even higher percentage of growers are members. Five large players, two of whom were never members, and three who had pulled out of the group at the deadline, have been instrumental in the reformation of the organization. In fact, two of them now sit on the board. In pairs, anyway, one gathers that the risks are now fully understood. We hope this documentary serves to illuminate the size of the risk in not putting your Capper Volstead rights to work, so that if you should find yourself in a similar circumstance, you don't have to go through what the pear growers did to get wise.